I'm going to be talking about uh, U.S. policy towards Africa. I'll, I'll take a little bit of a look back and then look at some of the dilemmas um, uh, going forward uh, as Africa changes. Uh, I think one of the, the one of the themes of this conference has been how much Africa is changing, how dynamic, how diverse, how divergent in some ways, and that really poses a challenge for. Uh, a unified Africa policy. So as an Africa policy analyst, I get asked all the time, well, what is US policy towards Africa? And the longer I'm in it, the harder and harder for me it is to, to say what exactly that is. Um, let's start with maybe what I would consider the three uh, clumps of interest that the US has in Africa. And these uh, are fairly consistent over time. Uh, first, you have pragmatic considerations of direct interest. Uh, those are things like economic interest, you know, strategic minerals, uh, oil, and so forth. You have security interest and counterterrorist interest. You know, top of that list is protecting U.S. citizens, U.S. assets, and the U.S. homeland. It sounds cold, but that's kind of what national interests in every country. That's kind of the number one priority. Um, and then trade and investment, uh, so helping uh, America uh, grow e economically, uh, which often depends on helping partners grow economically as well. The second set of, uh, set of interests is the values-based agenda. And I think this has been really what many feel is at the heart of American exceptionalism or ostensible American exceptionalism in, this, in, uh, in the world. Um, that there is a, 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 gener a sense of generosity, a sense of wanting to do the right thing in times of crisis for people who are less fortunate. Um, you have, uh, for example, humanitarian assistance in times of crisis, response to the HIV AIDS crisis, for example, um, a democracy promotion, I think uh, human rights, civil liberties, and human rights uh, and, and promotion of good governance and democratic governance has always been seen as an important core and pillar of U.S. foreign policy. We can talk more about that in a bit. Um, and then finally, this, the third clump is kind of the spheres of influence. Um, kind of uh, America's place in the broader world in terms of leadership, in terms of shaping global, go global governance norms, uh, in shaping global norms on human rights, governance, things like climate change, nuclear proliferation, where you need alliances and partners um, in, in, in helping shape those things. Now, these things, as I say, are consistent over time, I think, as, as areas or uh, collections of interests. But depending on the context within the United States, the US leader, uh, the U.S. public, the U.S. Congress, the private sector, uh, depending on dynamics within Africa, things that are changing, whether it's crisis, conflict, opportunity, um, and things that are happening in the more global geopolitical world. Are we in a bipolar world of, of, of superpowers? Are we in a more multi-power world where the U.S. has to look a little harder uh, to build alliances? Um, all of those shape these, these various interests and what gets emphasized at a particular time. Obviously, and I think it's important to, to emphasize to US policymakers that these things overlap in important ways. Um, we've heard yesterday, you know, at the heart of so much of the insecurity in Africa is bad governance, uh, repressive governments, lack of development, uh, poverty, unemployment. Um, and so, our direct interests may, in fact, emanate uh, from poor governance and so forth. In US leadership in the global world, failure to respond to pandemics like the HIV pandemic, or humanitarian crisis, or the conflict uh, and the genocide in Rwanda, those leave real marks on our US leadership in the, in the world. So these, these overlap in important ways. But at certain points, they also come into conflict, and they kind of butt up against each other. And there are multiple constituencies within the United States that ultimately shape our foreign policy. And sometimes they're working at cross purposes one another. And what you get then is accusations sometimes of uh, double standards or hypocritical or in inconsistencies in applying our so-called values and, and interests. 
So I thought I would look a little back in time uh, at US orientation and how these three sets of interests have evolved. Uh, in the Cold War, I would say that the sphere of influence uh, uh, paradigm was predominant. In the 90s, that gave way to a more humanitarian, values-driven agenda when there was no more kind of global, um, uh, global framework uh, that US policy fit into. In the 2000s, globalization of economy, of security threats, uh, I think led to a much more uh, a view of Africa as affecting US interests much more directly. And today, I'd say that a coherent Africa policy becomes even more difficult, because you have all of these various things. In a globalized world, Africa matters much more to the United States because of all the transnational connections. So interests are not only more intense, they're more complicated. And it's very hard to find the right balance among them. Um, you know, what, what, what is Africa policy towards Africa? Um, Nigeria versus Botswana, those are going to be two very different policies. Kenya versus Angola, Senegal versus Zimbabwe. It's very hard to have any overarching theme in that. And I think one of the critiques of the Obama administration has been, well, where's the narrative? What's your story on Africa? And the fact is, it's very hard anymore to have some overarching narrative that captures the continent that is so diverse. So let's go back a little bit, because I think it's important for US policy and how effective US policy is to look at some of the mistakes and some of the lessons learned from the past. I wanted to start with this. Now, Sangu mentioned this um, yesterday. I think it's, uh, you know, the modern maps today, as uh, Ambassador Pope just mentioned, were done by, in the 15th century, by a Dutchman who was uh, writing out navigation lines for Scandinavian uh, sailors. And so a very biased uh, map, a distorted map that really squashed Africa and Latin America down into the, the, the quadrant. It's a very good app online where you can take the modern map, but actually take country sizes and, and move them and, and compare. That's the United States, China, India, most of Europe, Eastern Europe. You got UK is the size of um, was, uh, uh, Madagascar. Uh, Japan is in there. We sometimes fail to appreciate just how large um, a continent mass, and that's largely due to European-made maps. So. <laughs> so let's move to the Cold War. For much of the post-independence period, um, sphere of influence, as I said, was kind of the defining characteristic. And the US-Soviet ideological battle over uh, expanding their spheres of control in the world uh, really framed the engagement. Now, we did have direct interests at that time. There were strategic minerals in key places um, that, that we wanted access to. Uh, there was a values aspect uh, to some of our policies. Uh, the Food for Peace program was initiated under Kennedy. You know, there's some debates on how effective that was and whether it was truly for African benefit or if it was for uh, getting rid of some of the excess uh, farm production here in the United States. Um, and Jimmy Carter uh, came in the midst of this Cold War and really for the first time introduced the notion of human rights into the US diplomatic engagement in these places. Um, my father was a diplomat in, in Africa at the time, and they had a heads of mission uh, meeting in, in Abidjan. And they announced that this would, uh, it was Andrew Young came and announced that this would be kind of the new line in, in US policy. And you know, my father's a pretty liberal guy, but he said all, the, all these suited diplomats kind of were looking at each other, you know, that's, we don't do that. We do real politic. What is this nonsense about human rights? <laughs> but it, it has endured, and that's now very much a part of, of how we see our foreign policy. 
And if I say we, I'm, I sometimes confuse me and the US government. I'm not with the US government. <laughs> I just get, take on this empathetic, uh, <laughs> not that I always agree with them. So, but during the Cold War, overall, our partnerships with African leaders stemmed largely from their anti-communist credentials. We did not care if they were uh, benevolent dictators even. We did not care if they were delivering services, human rights, economic benefits. Uh, it was really, we based our, our relationships on anti-communist credentials. So I thought we'd play Name That Cold War Partner. In our <laughs> And he, I was up there, but this is Sam Doe, Staff Sergeant Sam Doe from Liberia, who is known, um, uh, he was important to the United States because the US had an important CIA listening post in Liberia. Sam Doe is renowned for lining up the ministers of, his, uh, of the previous cabinet along the beach. There are horrific pictures and heart-rending pictures of this and shooting them all dead. Um, he, was a, a brutal man, uh, not very well educated, yet he was welcomed at the White House where um, Ronald Reagan warmly greeting him as uh, welcome Chairman Mo. So <laughs> that's a little story about that. <laughs> so he was important, but not that important. <laughs> Next we have uh, our, our favorite Mobutu Sese Sekou, um, Congo, just because of its sheer size, uh, the mineral wealth that it had was considered a strategic prize. U.S. had a very uh, speckled past, I, can't I can never remember that phrase, in, in, in uh, Zaire at the time. Uh, the assassination of the first democratically leader, uh, uh, Lumumba, if the CIA didn't do it directly, it certainly was um, you know, happy to see him go because he was considered too far left uh, for our US interests. Uh, Mobutu Sese Seko was put in place. I don't know how many of you remember uh, Mobutu. It was around him that the term kleptocracy was, was first coined. Uh, he received huge sums of money uh, from the United States, huge military assistance. The World Bank lent to him like there was no tomorrow, which ultimately left Congo when, when he departed in this massive debt that it took years to kind of uh, lift off. Uh, I just added this picture here. This is the famous rumble in the jumble, jungle with uh, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. Um, that was a good moment in Zaire. Uh, if you ever get to, yes, Ali <laughs> Boumaye, if you ever get to, want to see a, a fantastic documentary that looks at Zaire in that time, that looks at Ali and the, 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 uh, an athletic documentary that looks at uh, developments in the United States around the civil rights movement, you have to see When We Were Kings. I, I just uh, want to put that pitch out there. It's not totally related to the, to the talk, but it's, It'll, it gives a good, uh, uh, good sense of the times then. Next on the list of fame, Jonas Savimbi. Um, again, US was engaged in the Civil War uh, or backed uh, Savimbi against a Soviet-backed uh, MPLA, a Chinese-backed FNLA. Uh, the Cubans came in eventually. Uh, Savimbi was feted in Washington as a freedom fighter and a hero. Two of his main prompters, actually, in Washington at that time were uh, Grover Norquist and Jack Abramoff, and some of you may know them. <laughs> uh, Savimbi prolonged a brutal civil war. Um, after elections had happened, he kind of reneged on his promises, went back to war. Um, throughout this, interestingly, the US continued to extract oil from Angola, protected, ironically, um, by Cuban troops at the time. Finally, probably the worst of our U.S., uh, and I'm probably dwelling a little too long on this, but one of the worst of our uh, uh, partnerships during this time was with the apartheid regime in South Africa, which was considered a strategic partner to the United States because they were vehemently anti-communist. Uh, Reagan called 
uh, South African regime, the last friendly country in the region. The ANC in Washington circles, again, uh, uh, kind of fed by Norquist and Abramoff, uh, became labeled a terror group. Um, Jesse Helms and others, uh, kind of conservatives in, in the Congress, decried black-on-black -black violence, and it was just blacks killing each other, uh, really denying the fact that uh, it was this brutal, institutionalized, racist regime uh, uh, and, and that was feeding that. Chet Crocker at the time, and I've come to have great respect for Chet Crocker, but Chet Crocker's uh, 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 remedy for this was what was called constructive engagement. We'll, we'll keep working with the apartheid government, and that way we may be able to persuade them uh, to change their ways. I was in the Congress at the time, I was working as a staff member, uh, you know, very young. Chet Crocker was just the Darth Vader of the time. <laughs> uh, I think, I still think he was wrong on this. I think uh, constructive engagement with a partner that always, already sees you as a, a solid partner is just not effective. It just means business as usual. Uh, this was also a moment in US policy where that values agenda came back and you had that, the, that tension between strategic interest as, as the Reagan administration understood it and values. You had burbling up, and it had been over some time, the anti-apartheid movement here in the United States where churches, black churches, white churches, university students, activists, the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, many other politicians began demonstrating and pushing hard to impose uh, comprehensive sanctions against South Africa, against uh, Crocker's constructive engagement paradigm. Eventually, uh, a law was passed in, in Congress. Ronald Reagan vetoed it, didn't think it was time. Uh, again, public pressure Congress, even though it was Republican at the time, came back and overrode that veto, and sanctions were imposed. Um, I think this was a moment of the values agenda at its best. I think it was one of the few times that we saw Congress at its best. Uh, and uh, it was really, <laughs> it was a very exciting time to be there. You know, I go through this a bit of length, because this has had lasting damage, I think, to how we engage in Africa. You know, our, from the colonial states and, and their skewed incentives of extraction and control, we moved to a, a paradigm where the big superpowers rewarded countries not on their good governance, not on their service delivery, um, but on their uh, credentials, ideological credentials. So the incentives for good governance were just not there. Mobutu made, you know, tons of assistance flowed into um, DRC or Zaire, and none of it used to the benefit of Zaire Wa. Uh, so it undermined accountability, I think, in many ways, uh, by cutting off the democratic, natural democratic process. You know, we helped, in some ways, Although I, I don't, you know, we're not entirely responsible, but in some ways perpetuate the conflict, uh, undercut those measures of accountability, whether it was in Liberia, whether it was in DRC, whether it was in Angola. <clears throat> we left DRC with a massive debt burden because the, the World Bank would just lend uh, willy nilly. And we also left some lasting resentments in Africa. And I think you heard some of it coming out yesterday. Um, you know, conspiracy theories on, oh, who's beyond the Ebola crisis, who's beyond, you know, the CIA. I mean, we think those are ridiculous, but they resonate with people because there is this kind of history of subterfuge um, and by the U United States, and, you know, those kinds of narratives stick for a long time. Lasting resentments in Angola that still has a very prickly relationship with the United States, uh, and in South Africa. You know, I think we, as a nation, ended up on the right side of that fight in the end, and you know, Obama was out there picketing along with the rest of us. Uh, but there still remains huge resentment in South Africa about uh, the, the United States' role in supporting the regime. And 
other countries, the Soviets, China, uh, Cuba, uh, were actually working with the liberation movements. And they, that has given them uh, kind of a leg up in terms of reputation uh, with some of those countries. Ooh, OK. <laughs> I'll try to move forward a little quickly. With the end of the Cold War, uh, the, Clinton, the Clinton years, you kind of ha didn't have this defining paradigm anymore. Uh, and really, humanitarian impulse kind of came to the fore, that values agenda. There was not, not real perceived any strategic interests. Um, so humanitarian was going to be the, the rule of the day. The two major definers of the Clinton uh, uh, tenure were first Somalia and the debacle, what started out as a humanitarian intervention overreached a little bit and then ended up with 19 US servicemen being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu. That was a huge scar on the American psyche. And the idea was that the US would not be putting any more combat troops in Africa unless there was an absolute vital interest at stake. And that, that has remained very true until, until just recently. That Somali experience shaped US policy so much that when the Rwanda genocide unfolded, uh, the US very reluctant to get itself entangled into this humanitarian crisis, not only did not respond itself, but it also helped block uh, UN, uh, a UN mission from going in to respond. Um, you know, there were, may have been political considerations at stake. Uh, Susan Rice is famously quoted as saying, you know, we don't want to call it a genocide in election year because that will put pressure on us. So, so in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure she, she regrets that deeply. And I also think it accounts for some of her ideology in terms of responding to Sudan, Libya, and other places. I think um, that has left its mark. Um, and then humanitarian, uh, humanitarian intervention, the problem with it is if it's not pinned to uh, direct interests and th those direct interests understood, it can be very fickle and inconsistent. And if CNN attentions move somewhere else, you know, policymakers move some, somewhere else. You can try to do humanitarianism on the cheap. And I think out of the Rwanda debacle came, you know, African solutions for African problems. Like, you guys need to figure this out yourselves. UN peacekeeping is kind of the panacea for, for conflicts. Uh, huge burgeoning of, of UN peacekeepers at that time in Africa. In the second half of the Clinton administration, you saw a more exuberant, uh, exuberant outlook. The fall of the Berlin Wall, South Africa, democracy and multi-partyism breaking out in many, in many places in Africa. So there was kind of a new excitement towards the end of his, uh, uh, of his tenure. The embrace of new leaders, um, Isaiah Afewerki in Eritrea, Mela Zanawi in Ethiopia, uh, Yawari Museveni in Uganda, and Laurent Kabila in, uh, in DRC were considered new leaders who were really going to deliver to their people. Well, within five years, they were all at war with one another. And they are all, except for Melis, who died, still in power. And Laurent de Kabila, who, whose son carries on his legacy. So um, let me move to, so the, overall, the, the, the Clinton years ended up on an up note he traveled a lot to Africa, which really raised attention to Africa to US constituencies. And I think that is one of his enduring legacies, um, that he actually raised the profile of Africa. <coughs> the Bush years. <laughs> OK, that's not a <laughs> One of the things about Bush, you know, there were such low expectations of him in Africa. He, he, <laughs> he actually did really important things, not without mistakes. Uh, but also, I, I feel like he really enjoyed it. And when, you come, when he came back from Africa trips, he didn't have the kind of same defensiveness or closed in that if he was talking about Iraq or other places. I think he really enjoyed being there. And he enjoyed and he was proud of his legacy. And I think with good reason um, on many counts, uh, not, not entirely. At that time, Africa's profile was rising. You had new constituencies in, in Washington. 
Sudan, the flight between North and South Sudan mobilized this enormous constituency that included conservative Christians, liberal black churches uh, who, who, were, who were concerned about slavery or persecution of Christians. And that moved, uh, that built out eventually into the Save Darfur and so forth. So you had these big new constituencies building. Um, you had at the, really at the get-go, so a, a big push on Sudan was, was one of the first things he did out of the blocks and a very successful negotiation to end the war. 9-11 happened early in his term. Africa suddenly took on the significance. Could this be the spillover of where, where bin Laden and Afghan, Afghani fighters go uh, after they have been pushed out of Afghanistan? And the fear was that they would go into the Horn of Africa, Somalia, um, and uh, cause havoc there. Energy stakes. U.S. was looking very much to diversify its interests uh, in, in, in energy. 19% of its imports at that time came from Africa, uh, so a new interest there as well. HIV AIDS, at that moment, 25 million in 2000, 25 million Africans were infected with HIV. Uh, four 400, 4 million new infections in 2000 alone, and the trajectory was expected to go up like this. People were uh, dying um, without recourse to treatment. I, I really do have to nip through this. Uh, some of the big legacies of the Bush administration. Um, PEPFAR, $15 billion over five years. That has actually continued, and President Obama has preserved that investment over time initially very much focused on treatment. How do we get treatment fastest to those, uh, who, in, to those who need? And the, the idea, Congress, in a bipartisan way, came behind this because of the horror of HIV, and that you would bring treatment to, to those affected with AIDS, and you would see what was called the Lazarus effect. You know, it was a very visible, tangible impact of what um, US assistance was doing. Uh, President Bush launched the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which seeks to incentivize good governance uh, by giving big grants to, on, on economic growth initiatives in, in a number of these countries. That remains today. And he set up uh, the US Africa Command, which, which took responsibilities that had been held in European Command, Pacific Command, uh, and the Central Command, and put them into a new African Command that was going to do more gentle kind of Afri combatant, combat combatant command work, uh, perhaps a little too ambitious in its development, democracy uh, ambitions, quite controversial. And we can talk about that uh, a little bit during the Q&A. Obama years. Obama came out of the blocks a little bit slow, I think. Uh, he was facing a huge deficit. He was uh, facing two hot wars in Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, he had a global economic crisis, a domestic crisis, a battle on health care. Uh, and Africa was not particularly high on his list. He made a brief uh, trip to Ghana, where he decried big men, uh, but nothing, nothing major, really, in that first term. I think in his second term, he began to pick up what when, and had to, given, given what was happening on the continent. Insecurity, the three nodes of violent extremism and transnational crime, al-Shabaab in Somalia, uh, al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb and its various offshoots in the Sahel, uh, Boko Haram in, uh, in northern Nigeria, all of those called for some kind of uh, expanded response. Right now, the great fear is that Libya, uh, which is in so much chaos and caused overspill in previous years. Now with ISIL deeply entrenched there with huge arms, uh, arms caches, should there be some solution in Libya, the great fear is that those people spill back over into Mali, Niger, Chad, Nigeria, um, much more ruthless than they were before. Uh, and much more armed. So that is a huge concern. You're talking about the trench. How is it that the US can help fortify those countries uh, to prevent against that potential leech? Uh, health, uh, 
uh, HIV AIDS, those, those funding levels have been preserved, bipartisan support for them. The Ebola crisis response was, was very important with the US military providing logistics lift. You have a new interest in economic growth, trade and investment. Uh, in part, this is due to Africa's growing economic opportunities and the growth rates. In part, I think it wasn't driven, but it certainly peaked by China's role and their success in investment, in, uh, in making new inroads economically, which many Africans initially welcomed and said, look, we need roads. We're, we'd, we'd rather have a road to market than a lecture on human rights. Um, and the US felt, you know, we need to, uh, A, our private sector is going to lose out on some opportunities, but B, you know, many African citizens and governments are looking for something different from us than what we've done in the past. Uh, so a big shift in the Obama administration was to move, uh, to elevate that economic growth uh, aspect in our, and, and commercial engagement uh, within it. Democracy has been a little bit more problematic um, because we do have all these other interests and security partnerships with authoritarian governments, uh, civil, you know, the, the Obama administration has tried to reach out around governments to civil society. In many cases, that's, that's very doable, but in a number of places, Ethiopia, Rwanda, the government has said domestic NGOs cannot receive foreign funding, and that pretty much wipes out the domestic NGO uh, community. I think the irony is that our democracy assistance is best where there is a little bit of opening. Uh, so in a Kenya, in a Nigeria, in, in some of the places that are already slightly open where we can engage, but in deeply authoritarian countries like Angola, uh, Rwanda, even Uganda, I think we, we're much li more limited in our leverage. And those countries can look and say, you know, we don't need the US as much as we used to. We've got China over here, we've got other partners. The Washington says this doesn't make sense to us. What about the Singapore model? We, we, then, you know, that, that's what we want to go for, which is a more authoritarian model. Some of the initiatives from Obama's term, a number of them, I think they're hitting the right areas, uh, and they're designed to bring the private sector more fully into the mix. So Feed the Future, focused on agriculture, but trying to get private sector investment engaged in that. I think his biggest initiative legacy will be Power Africa. We, we talked about the obstacles to investment and, and growth yesterday. Infrastructure and the generation of electricity is probably uh, the most difficult barrier in terms of manufacturing, in terms of education, health, and all kinds of, of things. Africa, you saw that map at the beginning. Africa produces as many gigawatts as Spain, which fits into that tiny corner up in the Northeast. Um, and, and we heard that yesterday, 40% uh, lack access uh, to energy. It's very difficult for a company to go in and invest if they have to pay exorbitant prices for diesel. Trade Africa, US Africa Summit, again, that was intended to introduce a new Africa to the United States to get the private sector more engaged and uh, to kind of open Americans' eyes to the opportunities in Africa. Can I have one more minute? I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the issues with US engagement in Africa, and I think these can come out in the questions as well. First, the diversity and volume of interests in Africa just guarantees that our interests are sometimes going to be in conflict with one another. The question is, how do we balance those? How do we ensure that we're not doing the short term and not thinking about the long term consequences? Intervention in Libya was good, but look what it did for the rest of Mali and the, the rest of the Sahel in terms of setting off uh, violent extremism, takeover of territory, and so forth. Uh, second, the US assumption that all good things go together, democracy, economic growth, development, security, that's getting challenged. Some of our partners, Kagame in Rwanda, or Melis in Ethiopia, they're actually doing pretty good economically. And they're also security partners. And that, that makes US 
uh, US faced some difficult conundrums on how to deal with authoritarians who are actually, in some areas, doing OK. Ultimately, I think that growth will be stymied by that authoritarian governance. Uh, but for the mo moment, those interests are in tension. Uh, fourth, US touts this country ownership. And we, we'll, we just do kind of what the countries want from us. But as was said yesterday, a lot of those decisions are made in Congress. And Congress likes children. Congress likes maternal health. Chi Congress likes HIV AIDS treatment, because you can see the results like that. Congress is less keen about agricultural development. It's less keen about education, because you don't really see the payoff of education for a generation. And I think that was one of the things that we have tried to, to push back against. Uh, think, think longer term. Find better benchmarks so, so that you can invest in these things that are, are much longer term. Finally, it's a much more competitive political and economic playing field out there. The US is not kind of the superpower that it once was. The, our man in Africa can order people around. We have to be a little bit more humble. We have to try a little bit harder to be relevant and influential there. Uh, three areas that I would push for are agriculture and, and the business of agriculture, uh, infrastructure still, um, and in all my travels in the Sahel, whether it's a security, whether it's an economic, whether it's a national cohesion, social compact issue, uh, whether it's getting critical thinking going, education, to my mind, has to be key. I would like to see the same kind of investment that we put into HIV, AIDS, and health systems put into the education system. Uh, and my, my hope is that the next president, whoever that will be, will recognize that. That is something that, without exception, people comment. Civic education, life education, history education, as, as Kawa was saying yesterday, uh, those, are, those are totally critical, I think, to bring countries together to give a sense of common identity, a common grounding, uh, and the skills eventually to thrive. So just my final, I'll just leave it at that, and I will. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs>